So many of us growing up with ADHD, we set a goal, we start working toward it. Even if we think we're making progress, people say, well, why aren't you trying? I say, well, I really am trying. Well, it doesn't look like you're trying. We don't really make progress. We don't get acknowledgement. And then if we don't try, the same thing happens. Then if we try again, the same thing happens. And we, you know, we start to learn whether I try or I don't try, it's the same outcome. So why bother trying? Hi, uh, Dr. Handelman, Kenny, nice to see you and thank you so much for doing this. So if you could just introduce yourself, I always think it's better when, when the guest describes their situation, who they are and how they got here, and then we'll go from there. All right. So hi, my name's Kenny and I have ADHD. <laughs> um, I'm also a doctor, a psychiatrist. I'm trained as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, an adult psychiatrist. I work a lot with people with ADHD. I teach doctors and healthcare providers. I've written a book for parents of kids and teens with ADHD. Many moons ago, I had a website podcast that I did a lot of work with, and I may start that up again in the near future. Uh, currently running a clinic for ADHD in the Toronto area. That's how we met Mike. Thrilled to have you on our team. You're a wonderful addition and make tremendous contributions. And yeah, maybe we'll stop there. <laughs> sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. And can you just share a bit about your journey? I love that you just, the first thing you said was an I have ADHD. Um, <laughs> Well, we're talking to my people. Right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. So I know a little bit about you've told me kind of how it all came about for you, but you also have a pretty unique story in terms of the, the I guess, the qualities, right, or the superpowers of your, and sorry, did you say ADHD or ADD? I can't remember. Well, so I mean, look, well, I think we're going to talk about this a little later, yeah, but the yeah, official yeah. term is ADHD, but okay. I technically have the inattentive presentation. So I have what we used to call ADD, but you know, okay, thank you. tomato, yeah, tomato. Yeah. You know. yeah, yeah. But thank you. And we, we will distinguish that later. Okay. So the, your superpower in some sense helped you, you went to med school early, right? And you powered through all that. And I think I often... Mm -hmm see that in people where they're really excelling in sort of one domain of their life. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the superpowers, but then the things around that sometimes can be a bit disorganized. So I'm not saying that's your situation, but I'm curious kind of mm -hmm. how you got into medicine and, and what you're saying. Yeah. Your so, so yeah, I'm currently in my early fifties. I got diagnosed with ADHD at 40. Going back, I finished medical school at 24 and my psychiatry residency at 29. So yeah, I, mm -hmm. as you said, I powered through not knowing I had ADHD. So, I mean, you know, I don't want to go on and on about myself, but just a brief overview. Uh, you know, now I understand I actually grew up with a lot of privilege, right? That's the term now. And it's true. Yeah. Um, I happen to be quite bright from an early age. I realized I was interested in being a doctor and was quite driven toward it. Now, I had the wonderful opportunity to go to great schools. I had great parent support. Um, I went to schools that were academically enriched. They really captured my attention. I had the opportunity to be involved in a whole bunch of things. So my hyperactivity was being on swim team. You know, I, I'm 5'7", which is short, but when you're like, 12 or 13 in your five, seven, you're the second tallest guy. So I had a brief basketball career, but that ended very quickly. Um, and, uh, it was very mediocre, but I was tall for grade seven and then, um, stopped growing, but, uh, you know, swim team, I was on debating and model United nations and school newspaper. Like I used my hyperactivity for good things. Cause I was in a great school that captured my attention and you know, I had a love of learning and a strong desire to become a doctor from a young age. Partially, I think that was parent prompting. Partially, it was my own interest of enjoying sciences and wanting to help people. Um, and I think it, you know, I had a tremendous ability to hyper-focus when I needed to. So I'd sort of be the student who would, 
goof off during the semester. Like in high school, you could sort of catch up on a weekend. You know, in my undergrad, I could catch up in a week or two. In medical school, it's bloody six or eight weeks. So why was I goofing off for six weeks of the semester to spend like eight weeks catching up? I don't know. Undiagnosed ADHD, right? But I think if I didn't have the support and opportunities I did, I may have been the kid who was the bright guy sitting at the back of the class in high school, angry at the world, smart enough to be getting A's, but doing terribly and getting into a whole world of trouble, right? So I had tremendous support and opportunity. I think if I didn't know I wanted to be a doctor, I would have struggled, but I had a goal to work toward that meant a lot to me. I had great educational support and other things. So, you know, educationally and then professionally, I did well, but it was the other parts of my life that were my ADHD was much more evident. I mean, looking back now, um, you know, we would realize I actually had AD, obviously I had ADHD the whole time, but there were clear symptoms of it. But the understanding of ADHD in the late eighties, nineties was not such that we would have realized that a bright kid who was getting good marks and honors actually had inattentive ADHD. Um, mm -hmm. I actually got sent to a child psychiatrist when I was 15 by my parents. Um, I love them now. They were ama they're amazing. They were tremendously supportive. But in my middle adolescence, I hated them with a passion and I was so defiant to them. So it drive them insane because I was getting great marks and everybody thought I was great, but I made their lives miserable, right? Uh, so they sent me to an adolescent psychiatrist who I saw for six, seven, eight times. And he basically said to my parents, you know, don't worry too much about him. Give him some time. He's angry at the world, et cetera. Um, you know, but at the time he didn't diagnose ADHD, right? Like I was getting work done. I was getting great marks at a challenging school. So yeah, I mean, I consider myself very fortunate, um, as life got busier, work got busier, family, it started to be too hard to juggle all the balls and manage everything. And I realized I should get an assessment. And the irony was my book on ADHD had just come out like a month before I got diagnosed and then I got diagnosed. And then like many people with any kind of mental health diagnosis, um, I became really ashamed, right? Like somebody said to me, hold on a second. You just wrote a book about ADHD and you're supposedly an expert, but you didn't even realize you had it. What kind of expert are you? And I was like, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. How, like how embarrassing I feel so ashamed. And I think for different reasons, different people feel ashamed with a diagnosis, right? And it took some time to work that through and go for therapy and talk to the doctor and get my care going. And then when I got to about a year after diagnosis, I felt comfortable and solid in my own grounds. Like I kind of realized, you know what? I'm human. You know, I can be an expert in ADHD. And our, our understanding of ADHD has evolved, right? You know, when I did my training, it was mostly hyperactive boys with behavior problems, right? right? If you were a high achieving professional, intelligent, there were doctors who literally said, if you have a university education, you cannot have ADHD because the DSM criteria would say you have to be functioning, you know, sort of have impairment in your functioning. And people would define that as compared to the common individual. So as soon as you've graduated university, you are functioning higher than the common individual, right, so you right, don't have right, ADHD. Right. But of course, the real definition is, are you impaired compared to what you're capable of, right? So yes, I may have been getting high marks, but in many areas of my life, I was functioning below my abilities and it was affecting me, right? So um, anyway, yeah, so yeah. I kind of worked through that, got clear in myself and then decided, you know what? I've, I have no reason to be ashamed. I am different. I think differently. We it, we all go through this. We're all human. We all put our pant legs on one at a time sort of thing or our socks one at a time anyway. I guess you can put your pants on all at once, but you know what I mean. In any case, um, you know, so I decided I'd rather share with people the journey I've gone through. Um, and, you know, I love working with people with ADHD. Number one, my people, right? We get along. Number two, if I were in like banking or finance, when I like if I'm doing an important meeting, if I lose my train of thought or I get distracted by something or I impulsively crack a joke, which I probably shouldn't, 
in like finance or banking, they'd be like, all right, Handelman's smart, but I don't know about this guy, right? But when I'm working with ADHD people, they just feel so much more comfortable and they're thrilled that here's a doctor who gets them and I'm human too and I've got ADHD too and it all works, right? So mm. kind of makes the day go by so much easier. Oops, spending my money at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, that's lovely um, description of everything. There are a couple, so many threads to pull on, but one that I see a lot um, is what you said, and this certainly happened to me, was the, the, the I could, I have a hard time, I do, I am bright in, in certain ways for sure, but I was the kid at the back of the class, angry at the world. Yeah. Because here I am, I know I'm smart when I work, I get good grades, I excel, all that stuff. And at the same time, no, love my parents, not their fault at all. Just the way things were, not much support, not much awareness. And certainly I got very angry and resentful and mm -hmm. disconnected from the world. And of course my journey is around drug addiction, but for other people, it, without that sense of purpose maybe, or connection to something they care about and they can direct their attention to, and we see this all the time in the clinic, obviously, mm -hmm. is people who are bright, who are capable, but they're kind of just lost. Um, and I think that's a really important thing for many young people to hear, right? Is Yeah, if I can comment on that, I think, you know, one of the biggest gifts from my parents was, Kenny, you've got abilities, you need to work toward them, aim to achieve and contribute, right? And right. as much as I got upset with my parents or was angry at them in my adolescence, I, I held on to that. And I believed I could quote unquote, be successful. I could help people. I could make a difference for people in the way that I could. Right. And so mm -hmm. that drove me to work forward uh, and, and move forward with goals that matter to me that I've been very proud of. Um, now, I think what a lot of people experience with ADHD, like our school system is pretty darn good, frankly, and there's a lot of difficulties for people who don't fit the mold, right? And yeah. we won't, probably we won't spend a long time talking about that, but I have my opinions. You have your opinions. I'm sure our viewers of this podcast have their opinions um, and everybody has their own experience. But I think part of what happens is when people are growing up with ADHD, we sort of have this experience of I'm trying, right? I want to do well in my history class, my math class, whatever. Mom or dad teachers say, come on, Kenny, try. And they'll say, I am trying. Well, doesn't really look like it, right? And what do we want kids to learn as they grow? We want them to learn that I, when I set a goal that's important to me and I take steps toward it, I make progress. I may not achieve perfection. In fact, none of us really do. We can't, but I never achieve perfection, but I'm making progress toward that goal. And then people acknowledge it and I acknowledge it and I feel good because I've made progress, right? And so many of us growing up with ADHD, we set a goal, we start working toward it. Even if we think we're making progress, people say, well, why aren't you trying? Say, well, I really am trying. Well, it doesn't look like you're trying. We don't really make progress. We don't get acknowledgement. And then if we don't try, the same thing happens. Then if we try again, the same thing happens. And we, you know, we start to learn whether I try or I don't try, it's the same outcome. So why bother trying? Why bother setting a goal when nothing's going to work anyway? And I think our school systems are getting better. I think our understanding about mental illness as a whole is getting better. I think parents are becoming more accepting. I think there are more resources, but still so many people struggle with that and it's a real challenge. So, you know, I had the fortunate opportunity to have a goal that was meaningful to me that I could make forward progress on. Mm -hmm. um, and it meant a lot. So, and I did, of course, work my butt off as everybody does who goes through these sorts of programs. Um, but I did have a lot of support and a lot of opportunity, right? Yep. Okay. And then maybe I was, I'm, I'm not sure whether to ask you about the book and this idea of sort of attention difference disorder and how sure. parents are a big part of it. And then maybe we can get to the difference or historical difference between ADHD, ADD, and what the subtypes are. 
Yeah, for sure. So the book, the the title of my book for parents is Attention Difference Disorder. I'm not really meaning or wanting to change the name. Of course, it's been changed so many times, as you've said. It's really about a different understanding. And it came out of years sitting in the clinic where parents would say, how can you say my child has a focus problem when if I let him sit in front of the Xbox or iPad, he could sit there for eight or 10 hours if I didn't pry the things out of his hands, right? He can focus. And it's like, well, yeah, but he focuses differently, right? And those of us with ADHD, we can still focus. In fact, many of us can hyper-focus, right? Get so fixated on what's important to us, what the goal is, that we kind of neglect and ignore so many other things around us. And, you know, that's actually like neurologically not a good thing. I mean, it can be very helpful in our modern world, but if you think of back on the savanna or back in caveman times, whatever, if you were so focused on what you were doing that you were not aware of your environment, you could be killed, right? Survival instinct, you got to pay attention and be aware when you're hyper-focused in modern times, there's no woolly mammoth going to eat you sort of thing. So you may be productive when you, when sort of like the stars align and you finally like can hit that focus and get some stuff done for several hours, right? Um, so we focus differently we fo than other people. We still can focus. So we focus a lot better when something is new and exciting, when something's thrilling, when something gets our dopamine flowing. We focus a lot worse on things that are boring, mundane, and regular, right? So I remember years ago seeing an adult with ADHD who, you know, was sort of middle level management in a big corporation, had a lot of responsibility and, you know, took care of a whole bunch of things. And his electricity was going to be cut off the next week because he didn't get around to opening his mail and paying his electric bill, right? Like the task of the papers. Now, these days you can kind of automate it with your electronic banking and things. And many people use those strategies back in the day. You had to open up the envelope, find the bill, maybe even mail a check or whatever. And his electricity was going to be cut off. It's like, you know, man, you need help for your ADHD. Like you got to keep a roof over your head, right? So we can focus on things that are interesting, exciting. We struggle with more boring stuff. Now, people could say, well, you know, okay, so you can focus on things you'll like and not focus on things you don't like. Well, why don't you actually just work hard, try harder and stop being lazy, right? You know, which is sort of one of the core criticisms of ADHD to begin with. To that, I say, well, there are many medical conditions to, you know, where the symptoms change based on the situation, right? In fact, if you have heart disease, blockage in the heart arteries, to actually see if you have it, they'll put you on a treadmill, get your heart going and see if the strain impacts it right? See if it can show the symptoms of heart disease when you're in that situation. If you have asthma, I remember when I was first being tested for asthma as a kid, you know, at the, in Toronto at the pediatrician's office, he had me, you know, do breathe into a thing and then run up and down the stairs five times in his office building and then breathe again. And there was a difference. Okay. You've got exercise induced asthma, right? Like, uh, but the symptom wasn't there just sitting there. I had to be in the environment that brought out the symptom. So, those of us with ADHD, it's not just that we don't try, we focus differently. And I don't know if you want to go down this discussion, but it's really about executive functioning so that the, the bigger thing is it's about regulating the ability to focus, right? And executive functions are an important part of ADHD. We could take two minutes to talk about, we can focus on things that are interesting, exciting. We struggle with more boring stuff. Differences in attention are around the regulation of attention and the executive function. Yeah, please, if you could kind of go into that a bit more and just see kind of where sure. it goes. Yeah, yeah. so executive functioning, yeah, executive functions, and some authors, uh, teachers will talk about executive skills, right? So skills are something you can learn. Functions are things that just happen. And we certainly can teach and improve executive functioning. So uh, but these are the highest level thinking skills that we use as human beings to, you know, achieve our complex goals or regulate ourselves. So these are things like planning, organizing, prioritizing, time management, dealing with frustration, managing emotions, and also regulating our attention. In our brains, it's in the prefrontal cortex, it's the front part of the brain just behind the forehead. And that part of our brain grows and develops from the time we're born until we're almost 30 years old. And there's research out of the US from the National Institutes of Mental Health 
where they did brain scans of kids and teens growing up with ADHD over time, like scanned them every one or two years, I forget, something like 250 kids. And they also scanned kids growing up without ADHD and compared brain growth and development. And they found that the prefrontal cortexes of kids with ADHD grow and develop a little more slowly, on average two, three years behind kids who don't have ADHD. And that would account for some of the executive functioning challenges of kids. Now, even though the prefrontal cortex growth catches up, many of us with ADHD or all of us, depending on your definitions, have executive functioning challenges. And when I'm talking to people in a clinical assessment and I'm asking, how does this affect your life? How are you doing with work? You know, if I'm talking to an adult, how are you doing with the morning routine? Getting the kids out the door if you have kids. How are you doing with your work day? How are you doing with the evening? How are you doing with paying your bills? You know, planning your meals. How are you doing with managing money, driving? This is all self-regulation. So they think I'm just checking how it impacts them, but I'm also thinking about their executive functioning. Can they set goals? Can they stick with them? Can they manage the time, the obstacles, the frustration and keep going, right? So even though there are many different definitions of executive functioning, I think it all boils down to, can you execute on the tasks that are meaningful and important to you and your roles in life? And if you can, you don't really have executive functioning challenges. And just about every single person who comes for assessment of ADHD, it's because they're having trouble executing and completing the tasks that are important for them at their stage of life. Right. And that's where the impairment, as you said, to the daily functioning becomes an issue. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and can you, from that executive functioning piece, what are the different subtypes? So I guess, yeah, what are the different subtypes of ADHD? Yeah. So the current official diagnosis is ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder for everybody. Right. And then there are three types and actually they're technically called presentations now, not subtypes. Okay. okay. And the idea being it's kind of one disorder, one condition that may present differently at different points in the lifespan, right? Or in different individuals. So if you have significant inattention symptoms, trouble with focus, disorganization, uh, forgetfulness, distractibility, stuff like that, then you can have the inattentive presentation if that's your only group of symptoms. If you have significant hyperactivity and impulsivity, so the hyperactivity can be restlessness, uh, getting up, trouble sitting, sitting still, interrupting people. Um, impulsivity can be intruding on conversations, you know, doing things without thinking, etc. If you have mostly or only the hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms, you would have ADHD hyperactive impulsive presentation not the inattentive. If you have both, it's ADHD combined. So that's both inattentive and hyperactive impulsive. Now, a lot of people still like the term ADD, right? So mm -hmm. attention deficit disorder without the H. And that's what the name used to be way back. Um, now it's a, what we used to call ADD would actually be ADHD, like inattentive presentation uh, and ADHD is, you know, with the hyperactivity would either be ADHD hyperactive impulsive presentation or ADHD combined presentation, right? So it's now I'll see people and they'll say ADD. Oh, my son has ADD and we came to review this and that and the other. And then I'll a couple sentence later, sentences later say ADHD and they say, no, 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 ADD. And I say, okay, sorry, tomato, tomato, you know, it's, um, I understand what you mean. And if I'm saying ADHD in reference to your child, I mean ADHD predominantly inattentive, right? But I'm just so used to the medical literature of ADHD for everybody that I sometimes I turn it off and sometimes I don't, right? It's just habit sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. And okay. And on that note, can we sort of discuss the paradox, I guess, between maybe there's two things here. The the sort of rush to label kids who particularly young boys, although, and actually I think it would be helpful for you to also describe the difference for girls because often girls are underdiagnosed, I think. Um, so the, yeah, the sort of over-focus and also the lack of acknowledgement of these things, that paradox and, um, um 
Oh, and I'm curious. I learned recently that girls' brains develop, and also the prefrontal cortex, faster than boys um, by a couple of years. So I thought that was super interesting too, and that might also indicate why the boys in the class are more disruptive than the girls, and and so those are the kind of threads. Yeah, so, okay, I'll, I'll sort of go a little backwards from your question, yeah. starting at the end and move backwards. So okay. the insofar as the brain... I mean, when we think of executive functioning growth and development, which ties in with prefrontal cortex development right. over time, I think an easy way for people to, to understand this is maturity, right? Mm -hmm. So we think of individuals becoming more mature as they grow. And of course, in the normal growth in our society, you know, they have some responsibility in elementary school, more independence and responsibility in high school even more in post-secondary, whether that's work or apprenticeship or college or university, and then even more as full functioning adults, hopefully living independently, right? And on the biological side, the prefrontal cortex is growing and developing, right? And that's providing the infrastructure for more maturity, which we could define as better executive functioning, right? So a lot of girls become more mature than, like mature earlier than boys. Yeah. And, you know, boys with ADHD, if they're like, let's say nine years old, their prefrontal cortex may be similar to a non ADHD individual of seven years old or six years old. So they seem right. quite immature. Right. Where a girl of nine years old may have the executive functioning of a boy of 11 or 12, right? They're more mature. Um, so I think it's important to think about that. Um, girls with ADHD. Yeah, I mean, their prefrontal cortex may grow a little more slowly compared to other girls who don't have right. ADHD. Right. I, I can't say I can think of or have read a study that specifically compared girls' development versus boys and things like that. I'd have to look for a reference, but I think on basic principles, I hope that helps people understand that. Yeah. Um, and so far as the difference between boys and girls, and I'm glad there's so much more information out there about this now. We've kind of known this in the field for 20 plus years, as long as I've been in it or longer. Uh, and it's much more known now, which is great because I see a lot of women coming in for ADHD assessment saying, I never really thought I had ADHD because I'm not a hyperactive little boy who gets in trouble kind of thing. But now that I've seen online or people told me, or I read articles, I realize it's different in women and here are my concerns. And I'm like, yes, that is totally ADHD, right? So in kids, boys with ADHD tend to have more hyperactivity girls tend to have more inattention. So boys get noticed because they're hyper. Girls may daydream. The other thing is when a boy is hyperactive, he's more likely to disrupt the whole classroom. When a girl is hyperactive, she's much more likely to be a chatty Kathy who's too social and goes to visit her friends too much. So Susie, stop being so social, get back to your desk and do your desk and do your work, right? So it's not like you've got a problem that needs to see the doctor immediately. It's more, you're just being too social where the boy who has hyperactivity disrupts the class. And, you know, when it comes to ADHD, almost everybody has at least one other coexisting condition, right? In kids, 75% of kids and teens have at least one other diagnosis. In adults, it's 85 or more uh, wow. percent of people have wow. at least another diagnosis. So with boys, it's much more likely to have a behavior problem, oppositional defiant disorder, challenging authority, not listening, disrupting. So then the boys end up hyperactive and behaviorally challenging. The teachers say, get to the doctor, right? <laughs> um, with the girls with ADHD, they're inattentive and they tend to be a little more emotional rather than behavioral. So they're inattentive. If they're hyperactive at all, they're too social, too chatty. And then, you know, if they have behavior issues or sorry, coexisting conditions, they are more emotional, moody, anxious. And unfortunately, and I cringe inside to say this and please women, girls, females, anybody listening to this, please don't think this is my belief. But I think in general, people think, oh, she's just being dramatic, right? Like she's right. just being you know, a dramatic, you know, social girl, whatever, and she just needs to sit down. Yeah. And I cringe saying it because I hate it so much, yeah. the judgment that's there and the lack of understanding and support. Um, in women, and I, you know, the interesting thing I see with women, just to share some clinical frontline things. So I can say, yeah, similar thing, more inattentive, or if hyperactive, it's not the totally disruptive type. 
uh, less aware of it than men. Women, for the most part, and one can't always generalize, but for the most part in our society, women get more of the child care, more of the home care responsibilities, things like that, and kind of have to run the home. Now, if you've got ADHD, so men could kind of, if, if it's a heterosexual couple, you know, right, right. together, um, the man may go to work and come home and say, I've contributed a lot and go rest. Where women generally deal with the kids, go to work, come home, do everything else. Hopefully men, but it's almost one of these things. If the men help out a lot, it's kind of like, oh, what a good guy he's helping. Or if the woman's doing all the stuff, it's kind of like, well, that's just expected, right? And yeah, yeah, it's not it's always the case. And it shouldn't no, but be, but yeah, no, it is, it's a huge right? just to comment on that briefly, women today are having there's a huge double standard for them in that exact context that you're saying. Yeah. And we have to work through that as a society somehow. And absolutely. It's another incredibly interesting topic for yeah. sure. But yeah, yeah, it's hard. Well, and you know what? And I, I'm just going to come right out and say it. I yeah. blame Martha Stewart. Okay. <laughs> Not because of her insider trading and going to jail. Yeah. It's actually kind of funny. She hangs with Snoop Dogg. But yeah. <laughs> what I'm talking about is like the bloody TV shows that say, if you don't have the Halloween napkin rings on Halloween, that you're a horrible woman and a horrible mother and a horrible spouse or partner or anything. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm saying it only slightly tongue in cheek because- Women who are just women in general in our society feel tremendous pressure to be the professional, the spouse, the parent, the partner, yeah. and yeah. the homemaker who has all the wonderful treats and specials and goodies that Martha Stewart says so. Right? And it's not just Martha Stewart. I'm just for sure. A for sure. She's a good archetype. <laughs> for sure. And then, yeah. but then you have add ADHD into the pressures of women. And now, you have trouble focusing, you're forgetful, you're disorganized, you have trouble doing your home. And if guys are disorganized and have piles all over the place, oh, well, I kind of closed the door. Or I don't really care. I never cleaned up when my mom asked me. But if women have piles uh, all over the place or disorganization, the shame that goes with it is horrible. And so many women have this internal thought that if my home isn't organized, I don't deserve to go out and have fun with my friends or be social because I should be home cleaning. And other sorts of thoughts that are not necessarily valid, but torture them. Yeah. And then you yeah. throw kids in the in there too. And now you got to be the mom with the most. You got to have, oh, I love the movie Bad Moms. It's hilarious, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether that's somebody's cup of tea or not, it's just sort yeah. of like, I'm not going to have the perfect gluten-free muffins at the bake sale. And yeah. I'm not going to attend all the PTA meetings. And I'm not, my kids aren't going to have the perfect lunch and screw you who expect me to, right? Yeah. And yeah. So I see a lot of women who find out about ADHD through social media and realize they actually have symptoms, even though they didn't realize it. And the other thing is many people become aware of the impairment of their ADHD as life demands change, right? So sometimes it's going from elementary school to high school, and there are more demands, less structure, more independence. Sometimes it's going from high school to post-secondary. Sometimes it's post-secondary to workforce. In a lot of women I've seen recently, it's children right? They have children and all of a sudden, all the coping strategies they used to do to keep them on track are thrown out the window. You know, one woman described it perfectly where she said, I used to be disorganized all week. My house would become chaos. I would be behind on everything. And then Saturday morning, I'd get up and I'd spend six hours cleaning my home, going through the mail, dealing with bills, dealing with all the loose ends that had to be dealt with. And then I have a child who I love to the ends of the world and I cannot take the time I need and I never catch up and I'm drowning, right? And that becomes the trigger to say, I've got symptoms I can't manage here. The other thing I know, I'm, I, maybe I'm talking too long, but what I'm trying to help my adult psychiatry colleagues to understand in our field as a whole is a lot of people with difficult to treat depression, hard to treat anxiety, they're not doing well enough because there's ADHD that hasn't been recognized, right? And you got to figure out, is there, a, not that ADHD is the cause of all depression, not at all, right? Like, let's not overstate this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a colleague in Toronto, Dr. Martin Katzman, published a study, I think it was 2016, where he was looking at adults with treatment-resistant depression and screening them and assessing them for ADHD. He found 34% of adults coming to a specialty mood clinic with hard-to-treat depression had undiagnosed ADHD. Of course, when he starts treating the ADHD, they get a lot better. So a third, you know, it, that's very significant. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm getting uh, goosebumps actually because I think that's very much was my situation as well. Or mm. I think part of mine was, and I think when I first got diagnosed, the doctor was a bit quick to go to the antidepressants for me. And I mm -hmm. said, no, I'll just start with one thing, uh, medication for the ADHD. But as I healed and recovered from ADHD and sort of learned how to process things and organize my life, so to speak, to the, you know, <laughs> it's all relative, of course. Um, it's a journey. Trying, it's yeah, a journey. yeah, yeah. But no <laughs> doubt my depression and anxiety amongst the other things I was doing for myself de uh, decreased greatly. And my cycle, yeah. I would always describe it as I can't find this. I can't find that. I start getting late. I'm late for this. I'm late for that. I'm unorganized. I'm all over the place. And then the anxiety and the anger and the depression set in as a result of all of that. And of course, it's not perfect linear, but no doubt that was a huge part. And then I'd have sort of full on adult meltdowns and temper tantrums. And then I'd just be shut off and I kind of you know, need to go a lie down or I couldn't do anything or I'd be so dysregulated that wherever I was going, whatever I was doing, I was just going through the motions. I wasn't present at all. Okay. Thank you for sharing. I want to jump in and share, like I could, yeah. like, like you said, pull on a bunch of different threads. I really want to underline emotion dysregulation beyond sort of depression, anxiety. And I agree with yeah. you completely. It's such a good description of what so many people experience. The other thing is emotion dysregulation the bigger reactions, disproportionate emotional reactions right, to smaller right, right. things, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so many of us with ADHD have it. Um, and there's actually good research showing that ADHD medicines, and of course, psychotherapy, help this significantly, right? Mm -hmm. And so many people get misdiagnosed because of it. Sometimes it's bipolar disorder. Sometimes it's right. you know maybe not an official diagnosis, but uh, uh, an anger disorder in kids that can be called intermittent explosive disorder, but it's really emotion dysregulation with ADHD. And if you go back far enough, this was considered part of the disorder of ADHD. And then it was taken out in favor of the attention deficit and the hyperactivity impulsivity. Mm -hmm. But so many of us have emotion dysregulation. Again, women hate to say it, but so many women get misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder because they are having emotion dysregulation. It's hard to control emotions. It comes out with relationships and yeah. dramatic uh, moods and difficulties. And they end up, um, you know, with now some people do have ADHD and borderline personality disorder, but sometimes people are thought to have borderline personality or, you know, mild bipolar disorder, bipolar two with hypomanic episodes. And if they get the right diagnosis of ADHD and the right treatment, sometimes they don't really have that. No, sometimes they do, right? It's not, like I say, it's mm -hmm. not all ADHD, but there are people with the wrong diagnosis who need the proper treatment, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. I, can I just say something? I'm going to interrupt Please, you. Sorry. I totally no, misspelled my name here, right? I, I don't know how to change it, but it is hand <laughs> Dolman, D E L. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I typed it in fast and whatever. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't, I hope that it, that doesn't show up on the official recording, but we'll see. And we can fix it if it does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever. It's okay. I've got ADHD. I may rush through something and make a little careless mistake. What are you going to do? Right. Anyway, sorry to cut you off. That's awesome. No, I like it. Um, well, I can't remember exactly. I was talking about borderline personality yeah, and regulation. Well, how, how the sort of unobserved ADHD symptoms are such a part of these other diagnoses. And I like that you said it was uh, insightful or helpful to know the comorbidity, right? Or the dual diagnosis of so many people with ADHD. It's not just one thing. And that, I think that, do you think maybe we can talk a bit about the side of medicine and society in general that are very dismissive of ADHD? Yeah. yeah. I, I want to add one last thought to please, the previous, yeah, previous idea. Um, and that is, you know, I really, I'm glad we're doing this. Thank you for hosting me. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate your mission to help educate people and destigmatize. It's so important. And in the context of ADHD, part of the reason it's so important to learn so much more is there are so many ways ADHD impacts people that are not on the list of symptoms. 
right? So emotion dysregulation, very common with ADHD. Poor time awareness, time blindness, very common with ADHD. Inconsistency, right? Like it should really be on the list. Like I, I'm sure you have this, Mike. One day you wake up, there's no good reason for it. You may have slept well, you may not have slept well. It may be sunny, it may be cloudy. You may have eaten well, you may not have eaten well. And you are the most productive you've been in two years and you have no idea why. And the next day you wake up and there's no difference and you're like struggling to like meet your basic needs, right? Like we all have it and it's it can be wonderful when the stars align and whatever happens and you're so productive and other times not, but it's infuriating for parents and partners and coworkers of people who have ADHD who don't realize this is part of the ADHD. And when we get good treatment, we become more consistent. It's easier to follow through on the annoying, yeah. boring, simple things, right? So yeah. there are so many different ways it manifests. And it's I'm glad we have an opportunity to share this with people. And hopefully it's part of broader education and stuff. Yeah. So now we can talk about doctors if you want. Yeah, please. And we there's been threads of it throughout this the distinction. So my, just as an example... Mm -hmm. uh, my my GP is not totally dismissive of ADHD, although at the same time the doctor her is a little bit dismissive, and and I I think we'll never solve these conundrums or these disagreements in our society and in medicine. Can you just speak to that dismissiveness and also the over? association of symptoms. Oh, I must have ADHD, um, or that person must have ADHD and, and how we rush sometimes in either direction. Yeah. So, I mean, when I was in medical school, I, I guess there was probably one lecture about ADHD in a psychiatry unit, but I honestly can't remember, mm -hmm. uh, your average psychiatry resident who trains in Canada, it's five years and us, it's four years, unless they specialize, um, would get six months of child psychiatry and probably have some exposure to ADHD and maybe have one or two lectures on it. Adult ADHD just starting to be introduced, but it's not much better now than it was 20 something years ago when I finished medical school. Right? So we're not teaching enough. I think depression is understood. Obviously, schizophrenia, bipolar is understood. We're making inroads into the stigma and misunderstanding with mental illness. Um, but ADHD, it still sort of feels like, excuse me, the stereotype of the kid who's too hyper and takes pills. That's ADHD. If you're a doctor, if you're a therapist, if you're an accountant, if you're a teacher, if you're, you know, just try harder, right? You're fine. You know, I tried hard. I get distracted sometimes too. And I try hard and look, I can do fine. Why don't you do it too? Right. Pull your socks up. And, you know, we were talking a bit before uh, you and I, before the interview that sometimes it seems like there's a big rush to get diagnosis. And sometimes it seems doctors are so reluctant. And I think there's a really interesting, you use the word paradox. It's a really interesting paradox where on the one hand, it is in many times overdiagnosed or rush to diagnosis. And at other places, other times, it is completely underdiagnosed. And it's sort of a weird situation. And I don't really think the research suggests it's actually overdiagnosed, but that's what people okay. believe. Okay. Yes. Um, yes do, yeah. And, you know, there, there will always, I, I often see news stories. I've stopped paying quite as much attention, at least since the pandemic, but there would be news stories out of different countries like shocking the prescription rate for adults with adhd has doubled i'm like yeah it's gone from 0.2 percent to 0.4 percent and reliable research shows it's almost three percent or or thereabouts of adults who have adhd so at least we're making a little progress good job not enough but meanwhile the press is trying to make it seem into right. seem like it's a big pharmaceutical conspiracy right so yes, yes, yes. i think you know in my experience unless you know in my child psychiatry training i got interested in child psychiatry, obviously, I seemed to mesh well with the kids with ADHD. I got along well. I liked working with them. No surprise. We think the same way. I didn't realize it at the time, but, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to spend a year training with one of Canada's top ADHD researchers, right? Dr. Rushless Shacker at Sick Kids. So um, I got great training and experience with ADHD, but most doctors don't, even in psychiatry, right? So, um, Oh my gosh. I just lost my train of thought. Where were we going? 
overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis, and right. right. So most doctors don't realize it. I find doctors become a lot more comfortable with ADHD when they're, they have a family member diagnosed or they have a patient who was high functioning. They don't really believe they had ADHD, but some specialist said so. And then they see the dramatic improvement, right? Somebody that they believe just has a drug and alcohol problem. And then the ADHD gets diagnosed, they do their therapy and they work it through. And all of a sudden they're feeling better, functioning better. And the difference is dramatic, so much better than if they hadn't diagnosed ADHD. That's when doctors start to become quote believers, right? And it's, it's awful. This is the thing because, you know, this isn't like a religion. You don't have to like, like ideally it's science, right? Like, like this is a real condition. There's a ton of research there. We know what it is. We know many of the genetic and brain issues, though that's a whole other big frontier to discover. We know treatments that help, therapy, medicine. You don't have to like believe in it as if you believe in God or Christ or Allah or something. It's it's a scientific thing, right? So, but still, even though doctors are theoretically men and women of science or people of science, it's still sometimes takes belief change, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and for the people who... I guess I had two questions. One is how do people who aren't per se getting some validation or acknowledgement that, yeah, this might be a thing for them, how do they, this fits in, let me try to put it in the thread. There's the thread of when we're younger, we don't get the support. We have the, and I see this a lot too, is this, the, this sort of withdrawal and pulling away from life. Oh, no one hears me. No one sees me. No. And as you said really nicely, no matter how hard I try, nothing happens. So what's the point in trying? And that internal sense of either I don't matter or there's no point trying to figure this out because no matter where I go, nothing gets figured out and no one listens to me. And those, and that's a, common stigma for any mental health problem. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. And how, I don't know if I'm answering the question as I ask it, how do we encourage people in situations like that to then seek somebody else or, and I know this is a healthcare situation, right? Your um, wait list is now closed, right? And so it's, it's so hard for people to get the help once they get to the point of saying, wow, I actually really think I need it. Um, yeah. yeah. So there is for sure a, so there's the individual and the psychological aspect, which you were describing very well. I think there's also guilt in there. Like I yeah, should be yeah. doing it. I'm, you know, I'm not living up to whatever. Um, I should be using the resources that are available to me and I'm not. So it's my own fault, you know, different yeah. things like that. Uh, but then there are serious healthcare issues. So I think if an individual says, whether they're watching this or they saw it on TikTok or social media, or they read an article or a friend said, oh my gosh, I just got diagnosed. You and I are like peas in a pod. Maybe you should talk to your doctor, right? People often go through like a lot of barriers, right? First, they have to accept it. And there's a lot of self-stigma, right? There's a lot of, what if this is the case? Oh my gosh, my brain is broken and not working. What if I maybe I'm really probably just lazy. What they told me was right, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's the stigma of their immediate family, right? Like spouse, if they're, you know, an adult or partner, uh, their siblings, parents, you know, whatnot. Sometimes cultural beliefs are a big barrier too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really a lot of cultures apart, even in Western culture, there's stigma, but For a sure. lot of cultures that are not Western Europe and North America it's like an insult to your parents if you say, I think I have ADHD because it suggests they didn't raise you right. It's cultural beliefs that you're not willing to be a hard worker, et cetera, et cetera. So many layers. Yeah. And then you go to your doctor and God bless them. So many doctors say, oh, you're fine. You're not hyper. You don't have ADHD. Don't worry about it. You know, just try harder. Right. And oh, well, you've got depression. We'll treat your depression. Right. Like, so there's so many. And then where I now ask, and I, even in my assessments for ADHD, to be thorough, to tick all the boxes, to establish symptoms going back into childhood and all the things we need to do. It is the most unfriendly thing for somebody with ADHD to go through an ADHD assessment, right? Checklists, bring your old report cards, do, do this, do that, timeliness, paperwork, whatever. Like 
I cringe that I make people do it, but I want to be thorough and give them a proper assessment. And it's hard, but when they do it, they get the right assessment, diagnosis, and treatment plan that I like to think is kind of doctor proof, right? Like it's, I, I tick all the boxes, I'm thorough and et cetera. But the point is there are so many barriers. And if you talk to your doctor and they say, nah, you don't have it. Well, then if they say, well, okay, but I don't know where to refer you, go find somebody. So now we're ta asking people with ADHD that's undiagnosed, untreated to do like 27,000 steps in the direction that it require organization and planning and everything else. So it is particularly difficult. I think we're getting better. I, you know, I do my best to be involved in educational programs and uh, help doctors learn more, different things like that. So, you know, we're hopefully getting there, but it's not easy. It's not an easy journey for people. Uh, what I would say to anybody who's watching this, who hasn't been assessed or diagnosed yet and believes they have it, is stick with it. It may take you longer than you think. I mean, I saw somebody this past week who said, you know, feeling, you know, they had a lot of social anxiety and they said, just even judging myself or worrying about what people would think held me back from getting the referral for a year or two. Right. And that, that happens to so many people. So, you know, persist with it. It may not be perfect. It may take you too long. You may not do it right. But if you get yourself assessed and diagnosed, you start, you have the opportunity to get treatment, right. And get things more on track. And hopefully we can open up the education to a lot more doctors and doctors will be more accepting. And there's different healthcare system issues, whether you're in Canada, like we are, US, Europe, other countries, developing countries, you know, there's a lot, right? Like it's, but yeah, hopefully people can persist, right? At least if you learn about it and think it sounds like you, you can, while you're going through the process, listen to podcasts, audiobooks. you know, I always say, I tell people, I recommend a, a particular cognitive behavioral therapy book for adults with ADHD. And I say, you know, bibliotherapy, like doing therapy through a book is great, except when you have ADHD, you know, you may get the book, get excited, read four pages, put it down and find it under a pile nine months later and do absolutely nothing. Right. So it's, it can be really helpful, but doesn't always get followed through on. Right. It's yeah. the challenge. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay. I think. Maybe one piece we didn't touch on, and I know we're kind of running up on the end of our time, is the, you did mention it a bit briefly, where I like to think about it, so the parenting piece, and this is obviously more for kids and teens, I think when, as parents, when we get frustrated with the symptoms that come out in our kids. So not being organized, being late, getting out the door, keeping notes and homework and all those kind of things. I think what I see a lot is when the parents jump in to do the things for the kid because of their own discomfort and their own anxiety, that's a huge piece. And I, sometimes I describe it as the, the parent is taking on the executive functioning development of the kid when they jump in to do those tasks for the kid. Yeah. And it's hard for parents to let go sometimes or to see their own part in the problem, I guess, right? Or in the in the journey. And and maybe and how I remember you I asked you sort of in a, in a clinical manner, something along these lines of bringing the parent into the conversation. You gave me such a good answer. Um, so maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. And then what was the answer I gave you? Don't leave me in suspense. <laughs> well, I don't want to say it because I want to hear <laughs> you say it. Okay. If I totally okay. forget what I told you, jump in okay. and remind I, I me will. what my okay. wisdom was. Okay. I'd appreciate yes. it. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> um, okay. So look, I think when we think of Treatments for ADHD, particularly in the context of kids and teens, the research is very clear that medicine plus therapy works really well. Well, that statement applies to ADHD across the lifespan, right? Pills don't teach skills. Um, if you learn the skills but can't really use them because you can't focus, you don't really benefit from them. So ideally, combination medicine and therapy. There's good research for kids and teens that parent management psychotherapy, so parent support is very helpful. Individual psychotherapy for younger kids, you can only accomplish so much. Um, in teens, there's more ability to work. Cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the best researched model for adults with ADHD, works quite well. It teaches skills and helps with the thinking and the emotions and things like that. 
But to be able to do that, you have to like think your thoughts, but then also like think about your thoughts and analyze your thinking. And when you're a young kid or a teen, depending on your maturity, your executive functioning, you may or may not do that very well. But there's absolutely a role for kids to learn some behavioral strategies. But parent management training is really important. Now, a lot of parents feel like this is parent blaming, right? Okay, so my kid's having trouble. Um, I was worried. I didn't want to come because I was worried you were going to blame me as mom or dad or whatever. And now I come here and you tell me I got to go to therapy because my kid has troubles. Obviously, you think it's me. And the answer is not at all, right? Um, In my view, parents are not the cause of ADHD, but they absolutely need to be part of the solution, right? ADHD is predominantly genetic, right? We think of a biopsychosocial model. So there's the biological component, the psychological, the social, but it's so genetic. Genetics play a big role. So we don't choose the genes we pass on to our kids, at least not now, and probably not for a good long time. So you didn't control it. You didn't create it. It is what it is, right? But I always think like if a kid's diagnosed with diabetes and they need to manage blood sugar, their parents will go to the diabetes education center with them and they learn what to do. What do we do when the blood sugar is high? What do we do when it's low? What do we do when he goes to soccer? What do we do when he goes to his friend's house? Right. And they learn strategies and structures and the parents, you know, essentially create structure around their kid and make sure that any responsible adult knows what should be done in different situations. And that's exactly what we're looking for, for ADHD. Now, if any parents gone through parent management training and psychotherapy, they realize It's a lot about self-regulation, right? Because as you described, your kid with ADHD can do things that gets under your skin and challenges you. And as we talked earlier, many adults are just busy as anything. And because ADHD runs in family, they may actually be ADHD-ish or have ADHD that's not diagnosed yet. A lot of parents, a lot of adults I see say, I came in for ADHD assessment because my kid got diagnosed and I looked at the list and said, oh my goodness, sounds like me, right? So It can run in families. There may be more than one ADHD member. And so a lot of the parent management therapy is learning to be present without the emotion dysregulation. Your kid will try to push your buttons and you need to do your best to stay calm. We are all human. There are no perfect parents. In fact, if you try to be a perfect parent, you're not going to be a perfect parent. This is how we get the helicopter parents and the new one, the lawnmower parents who let me clear the way so yeah. my child will never fall and scrape his knee snow or knee and whatever. <laughs> yes, yeah, no plow, whatever, right? It's like, I will clear the path so my little sweetie doesn't have any trouble in life. Well, if they don't have any trouble, then they don't grow up well, right? Like we all have yeah. to grow and learn. So yeah, it's a lot of self-regulation. It's behavioral strategies. Uh, it's a challenge, but I really encourage parent management training and it's not parent blaming, um, but it really makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and awesome. let me share one other thing. Can I share yeah, one more please, thing? Please, please. So, you know, yeah, yeah. one of the hardest things with teenagers, just thinking about adolescents, you know, so many teens are dealing with challenges and it just seems to be getting worse even post pandemic. So many challenges around social issues, bullying, cyberbullying, drug and alcohol issues, sex and sexuality, gender issues, other things. And they may come home and their parent, like many parents do, says, get to do your homework. I'm not doing it now. Well, you're misbehaving. Pick up your jacket. The hook is two inches from where you dropped it. Please don't make me every day come and do it. And while we're at it, let's get up to your room and clean it up. It's been more than a week and you haven't done it and it's disgusting. And the kid retreats to their room, slams the door, gets on social media and doesn't say another word to their parent. Meanwhile, that day, they may be considering self-harm or suicide or whether there's any point in pursuing education or their future. And their parent who loves them so deeply wants to be the person that they can trust, that they can talk to about all these really difficult things that they're facing, especially post pandemic world where school got disrupted, social life got it disrupted, exercise got disrupted, et cetera. And they won't go talk to their parent because they got yelled at because their jacket wasn't put on the hook, their dish wasn't put in the dishwasher, and they're behind on their homework and their room's disorganized, right? And I'm not saying to parents, don't hold standards for your child. Of course, you need to. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying if you work with a therapist and realize and you prioritize, what are the top things? There are some non-negotiables, right? You need to be home at this time and you got to make sure the door is locked, okay? Like for safety. Um, 
You're not driving while drunk. You're not, you know, taking a weapon to school. Like, whatever. There are absolute... You're not sticking, a, you know, metal into an electric socket, right? There are absolute things that cannot be negotiated. However, there are many things you can close your kid's door, right? You can pick up the jacket and say, I'm not going to fight over this tonight because I want to talk to my kid about their future and their education and be there to support them and listen to their fears and help to build them up, right? So obviously this is oversimplified and every individual is an individual, but I think, you know, parents, sometimes we need to think about things differently uh, and getting professional help when needed can make a dramatic difference. Yeah. Awesome. <sighs> Thank you. Maybe that's a good place to to wrap it up. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, we could keep going. Are there any, maybe lastly, sort of any other things in this domain that we didn't talk about? Or generally speaking, when you think about ADHD, society, assessment, treatment, mm -hmm. um, the path that are important to, to mention? I mean, I think, you know, I'd like to probably finish with more thinking about strengths and differences, right? Uh, in my book, I talked about sort of the gifts wrapped up in ADHD. These days, I'm talking a bit more about the strength-based approach. Um, you know, neurodiversity is a relatively new term that when it first came out, really referred to autism spectrum. I think now it's kind of broadened to ADHD as well. And those of us who think differently and our brains are wired differently and we don't necessarily fit the mold. And while that can be very hard and soul crushing through a standard education. And while that can be very hard and soul crushing in a boring, repetitive job, it gives us the opportunity to think differently, problem solve differently, be outside the box and make contributions in ways that many other people don't see. And so I feel it's really important to take a strength-based approach to help people to realize we all have strengths, even if all the terrible things we've talked about throughout this time together where, you know, the, the self-stigma and not going well and judgment from others and losing one's hopes and dreams or whatever, there are still strengths inside you that can grow and develop and make you unique and give you the opportunity to make a contribution that others won't even think of or consider. So, mm. um, you know, I take some time in my assessments to talk about strengths and help people to realize you have strengths too. You may be really different. I mean, I think one of the gifts of social media and proliferation of sci-fi and other big, you know, box office movies, whatever, is kind of like maybe a bit cool to be a nerd these days. Maybe, you know, it's not just our nerdy friends and colleagues and ourselves aren't just hiding in the closets feeling geeky all the time, right? Like it's, you know, so we're different. We think differently. We can problem solve differently. We can contribute differently. And I think it's important to acknowledge our strengths, recognize them, and build them. Yeah. Lovely. And I think that also fits so nicely into the, when you can recognize that, or I think often helping people believe that that's true in them. They know some part of them knows that it's there. Mm -hmm. Although working through all the stigma and the doubt and the sort of self-criticism to get to that point. But once they can start opening up to that and start believing it and seeing it in their life, that generates so much of the motivation and the purpose and the drive, I guess, or or the stick to itness, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, uh, to move forward and to thrive even. And um, yeah. Yeah, it's so nice when you see that unfold in people. It's really inspiring and it happens yeah, so mean, often. Yeah. Well, yeah, and so many people I see with ADHD, they'll say, I have trouble with this, I have trouble with that. And then they say, yeah, but then there are times where I have so much energy and I'm super motivated and I get so much done and it's incredible. And sometimes it's thought of as actually hypo a hypomanic episode, right? Like right, right. increased energy, increased motivation, sleeping less, completing a lot. But when I go in and I ask the questions, this is just a super hyper-focused time. And part of the goal of treatment with ADHD is to get a lot of the challenges out of the way so it's easier to have more of those, right? It's easier right, to say, right, right. I have a goal that matters to me. I'm going to work on it. I'm excited about it. I'm going to hyper-focus and create things because they're meaningful to me and they can help others, right? And that's yeah. that's when we can, our sort of magic unleashes, right? Yeah. I, and, and to carry that a bit more, when when you experience that, or in your own life or have, 
another thing I think that's super helpful for people is when that dies down and the drive decreases and they're in a bit of a lull, that's okay, right? Yeah. Like I think we get caught up in the expectation that it, it needs to be like this all the time, right? Or to use the CBT yeah. um, distortion, it should be like this all the time or it must be, or if not, I'm a failure or whatever. Yeah. And, and that helps maintain the likelihood that it'll arise again. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like if you run a marathon, unless you're like a super duper ultra marathoner, right. you got to stretch, you got to recover, you got to do some recovery runs, and then you got to like give your body a bit of a chance to heal. Right. 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 You know, and another way I think about this, and I really noticed this when I would go travel internationally for, you know, short times, I'd go overseas to the World ADHD Congress. The last time I was overseas was before the pandemic 2019, the World ADHD Congress in Lisbon. And I will hopefully be going you know, to Amsterdam in two months for the World Congress again uh, in 2023. So, um, but when you when I travel to Europe for like five days and come back, man, I'm exhausted when I get back. And that's when I really realized to function well as an adult with ADHD, there's the foundation, sleep, nutrition, exercise. Then there's the planning, organizing systems, right? Calendars and to-do lists and whatever. Then there's the sort of work and the motivation and other things. When I come back and I'm exhausted and sleep's disruptive, eating's disrupted, exercise is disrupted, I get through the absolute must-dos of my day and then I'm a vegetable, right? I sleep, I'm exhausted, I'm jet-lagged, right? And gradually over several days or weeks, I build the foundation and I come back. So if you have super productivity, yeah, you got to recover. That's natural, right? right. There are right. seasons, there's ebbs and flows. But yeah, like you said, you got to be careful for that negative self-talk of, really, you know, self-criticism that just sort of cuts you off at the knees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so nice. My pleasure. Thank yeah, you for having me. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it is a lot of fun. Hopefully uh, sometime down the road we can do it again. Um, but yeah, thanks again for your time and may the force be with you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'll just say at some point Please. I may restart my ADHD podcast, but I do have a website at drkenny.com and I don't really send newsletter emails, but if you want to get updates, if you go there and put in your name and email address at some point, hopefully this year I'll be ramping up this online stuff again. So, Wow. And is it literally drkenny.com? Yeah. Amazing. And the, the clinic website is... Yeah, the clinic website is cfimh.com. So Center for Integrated Mental Health uh, in Oakville, Ontario. Yeah, we can, of course, we can leave it in. People can know about it. We have a long wait list, but yeah. <laughs> and Okay, and, and if people want to get your book, Attention Difference Disorder, How to yeah. Turn Your ADHD Child or Teen's Differences into Strengths in Seven Simple Steps, that's available on uh, Amazon, Amazon bookstores, yeah. et cetera. Right? Sure. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks again. And I'll, I'll include all those links in the sort of show description and everyone, everything Great. like that for people. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much, Mike. Take care. Okay. Bye. <laughs>